thank you for inviting me and giving this opportunity. I want to discuss the very basics in radiography and how it pertains to ICU radiology. The lecture is to know the normal chest X-ray, the importance of certain dimensions and the interfaces, no signs that help in the diagnoses, under the role of a radiologist in the ICU and the CCU setting, or the ideal position of life support devices and reasons behind them. This is a normal PHS radiograph. The cardiothoracic ratio is 50%. The diameter of the heart should be half that of the coronal diameter of the chest. The diameter to remember is vascular pedicle, which is the composite of venous and the arterial structures emanating from the heart. It gives us an idea about the fluid status of the patient. You must be mindful of the orientation of the trachea and the main stem bronchi, and remain mindful of the fact that the right main stem bronchus is more vertical than the left. The curved it is caused by the left subclavian artery as it courses over the left apex over the left first rib. The tracheal stripe, not quite as well delineated, but it should not be more than two millimeters in thickness. This junction of the right innominate as it joins left and continues on as the superior vena cava. This is the convex bulge of the azygous vein. It should not be more than half the tracheal diameter. This Current interest is caused by the contact of the right lower lobe with the azygous and or the esophagus, and it's called the azygoesophageal interface. This point marks the atrial junction, where the superior vena cava joins the right atrium and the convexity of the right atrium starts at that point, and an important junction to remember. This is the AP window. This is the aortic arch, the concavity being the AP window, and it is the central pulmonary artery. This is the interface of the descending thoracic aorta, called the contact of the left lower lobe with the descending aorta. Two important locations in the lung, lung, lung member are the posterior basal segments of the right and the left lobes, and they're seen below the level of the diaphragm and important to bear in mind, and be of roughly equal radio density. One important thing to remember is the, the diameter of an end-on blood vessel should be roughly that of the end-on bronchus. It should be equal. And a uh, the vessels become larger in situations of fluid overload. So that would be a good uh, landmark to keep in mind. Left lateral view, and it's indicated by the uh, radio pick marker, tells us that the left side of the patient is closer to the radiographic plate, which means that the right would be more magnified. So you can see that the right ribs are much larger than the left ribs, and we can say that this is the right posterior chest wall and this is the left posterior chest wall. And the corresponding costophrenic angles are delineated here. This is the anterior retrosternal airspace to um, keep a look out for in case there is anterior mediastinal abnormality. Usually both uh, lateral borders of the scapulae, but here you can only see one. But it causes, along with the parascapular uh, muscles, is in density in the upper uh, hemithoraces on the lateral view. The result of that, as you cross from the diaphragms to the upper lungs, 
there is a gradual increase in radio density. The fine line is caused by the posterior border of the bronchus intermediate. Keep in mind, just in case you're dealing with right hyalur pathology. Interface caused by the posterior margin of the left ventricle. And this is the margin caused by the posterior margin of the IVC. This left ventricle is in the left hemithorax and this is in the right hemithorax. Recap the some of the lines and interfaces we discussed. The left tibian interface, the paratracheal stripe, the the cava, the atrial junction, right heart border, take arch, AP artery, ding aorta, and the esophageal interface. Two posterior segments on the paraspinal in the paraspinal regions of roughly equal rate density. Simple example of pulmonary consolidation. Silhouetting of the left heart border. It would be inappropriate to report this as left basal pneumonia or left lower lobe pneumonia. This in the upper lobe in the angular to be specific. There's delineation of this opacity by the minor fissure, and we know that the right middle lobe is in contact with a minor fissure. So this is a middle lobe and a lingular multiple pneumonia, and that's confirmed by the lateral view. Here, not so subtle. The right is clearly silhouetted, so we know that there's something wrong in the right middle lobe. And um, by the actual view. Very increased density above the minor fissure by a right upper lobe pneumonia. Let's get some really complicated, challenging cases. The prior radiograph, and this is a graph we are dealing with. This is how the posterior basal segments are equally loosened. And we see the follow up radiograph. The C we see in the paraspinal region is lost. So there are bibasilar posterior opacities mostly caused by operation. Another sign to remember is the uh, the posterior positive spine sign, where when you go on the spine, instead of the density increasing, in other words, getting whiter, you see a white area, and then it becomes dark again. That's the positive spine sign. And in this example, you can see that there is increase in density in the lower regions with an air bronchogram caused by right lower lobe pneumonia. This has normal opacity in this right basal region. Compare the two basal segments in the paraspinal regions, the right side is clearly denser than the left side. And if you look, the azigoesophageal interface, you can trace it above this point. What you're seeing here is the anterior junction line where the anterior right upper and left upper lobes are coming together. That's the anterior junction line. And your eyes are basically connecting the two points. Nothing really exists here. This is where the azigoesophageal interface stops. So that is sweating of the azigoesophageal interface, and it corroborates our suspicion for a right lower lobe consideration, and it's right lower lobe pneumonia. Again, demonstrated here is the active spine sign where the 
increase in density followed by loosening as we go up on the spine. Left lower lobe pneumonia, posterior basal segment is denser when compared to the right side, and there is silhouetting of the descending thoracic aorta, trace it beyond that point. This is lower lobe pneumonia. Example of acid density of the posterior basal segments in the, the pararegion, silhouetting of the descending thoracic aorta. Speed reading, you would probably call it normal, but this is a patient with lower lobe pneumonia. Very subtle example where we see vase and density, asymmetric density of the paraspinal posterior basal segments. If you take my word for it, you are connecting this and this part, but in reality, nothing exists between here. And this is left lower lobe pneumonia. And if you cover the aphase above and below, you realize you do not really have an interface that corroborates our suspicion for a left lower lobe pneumonia. And that patient also has a positive spine sign. And it also has silhouetting of the left hemidiaphragm. You cannot trace the left hemidiaphragm beyond this point. You should be able to trace it all the way down to the costal margin. This is the right hemidiaphragm seen all the way going anteriorly. Positive spine sign and silhouetting of the diaphragm due to left lower lobe pneumonia. Showing these very subtle cases because these are the things that affect quality of care. Example here, it's normal on the right side where the paraspinal is denser on the right. This is abnormal. There is opacity in the right zone. And if you see that the azagosophageal recess cannot be traced at a certain point, so the silhouetting of the azagosophageal interface. This is lobe pneumonia. And you see the positive spine sign. You denser vertebral bodies here, and they loosened as you go up. So this is abnormal right lower lobe opacity. Instant again, we have asymmetric posterior basal segments. Left lower lobe is denser. The wearing of the diaphragm beyond this point. You don't see the descending thoracic aorta. If you're reading, you would probably say, but that's abnormal. Pneumonia. It's also producing an abnormality on the lateral view where the post hemidiaphragm is silhouetted by the consolidation. I identified the PA and the lateral view so you could appreciate what I'm trying to demonstrate. This is the abnormal increase in density compared to the normal right posterior basal segment. This is abnormal. You see a descending aorta. You don't see the hemidiaphragm or lateral view. On 17, had fever. They showed sticky opacities at the left basal region with some fibronodular opacities in the right apical region. Subsequent radiograph, persistent fever, still in the ICU needing EKG monitoring. You can see that the patient has developed an opacity which is silhouetting the descending thoracic aorta. This left lower lobe superior segment pneumonia. we should be aware of is asymmetric lung density. This various differential possibilities would include either layering pleural effusion in the supine position or asymmetric lung air 
air trapping on the right or partial collapse on the left. But more often than not, the asymmetry is caused by what's called the anodal heel effect. If technician does not put the anodal side of the x-ray tube towards the patient's head, it will result in this asymmetry. And the way to tell that this is technical is to compare the radio density of the soft tissues outside the chest wall, and you will realize that the left is denser than the right. So this is clearly caused by a technical problem and is not pathologic. Example of an apparent elevation of the right hemidiaphragm. Note that the left hemidiaphragm has its highest point midway between the spine and the thoracic cage, the costal margin. But on the right, the apex is apparently lateralized, and that's caused by subpulmonic pleural effusion. The decubitus, you can demonstrate the sizable right pleural effusion. An example of a subpulmonic pleural effusion, lateralized uh, of the apparent hemidiaphragm caused by subpulmonic effusion. Not obvious, but still somewhat lateralized CP all laziness at the base caused by a pleural effusion. Full lateralized apex of the right hemidiaphragm, pleural fluid with chest tubes, sonic pleural effusion. As intent, intensive care radiologists, we should uh, always. Uh, Keep trough is the patient's fluid status by uh, assessing the vascular pedicle, which is composite of venous and the arterial uh, just emanating from the heart. Patient, even though I don't have dimensions on this one, but even by eyeballing, we know that this vascular pedicle is much wider than this. Patient's lung volumes are lower, and there's higher haziness. This is caused by fluid overload. The patient had fluid overload as well. The vascular pedicle is almost a centimeter wider. It's called pulmonary edema and increasing reticonodular opacities. We appreciate the overload of fluid by comparing the endon bronchus with that of an endon pulmonary artery. You can see almost twice the diameter, so this is really an example of fluid overload. So we'll just roll in ICU radiology. We really are the frontline defense in the fight for life. We to assess each and every life support device, iatrogenic complications, diagnose and follow medical problems. I will discuss two basic life support devices, respiratory, hemodynamic, and gastrointestinal. Two respiratory devices I will discuss is endotracheal tubes and tracheostomy tube. This is an endotracheal tube, which looks pretty much like a Foley catheter. It has a retention cuff at its end and is somewhat more rigid than a Foley catheter. The endotracheal tube should be five centimeters above the carina. What? Because the tip of the, cath uh, the endotracheal tube moves four centimeters from full extension to full flexion of the neck. So always try and assess the neck position if possible. And then always remember that the carina moves up and down by approximately two to three centimeters with each breath. The tracheal tube where the retention cuff is over distended. This will eventually lead to rare or tracheomalacia. Tracheostomy tube, remember the two third rule, be two thirds intraluminal, in other words, two thirds of the tube be parallel to the tracheal air column and one third sticking out, and it should be towards the tracheal diameter. The tracheostomy tube is dangling, and this is impending extubation, so would require an emergent 
phone call. Complications of intubation that we should bear in mind. Temperative, we should look for bleeding and air leaks. Consequently, barrier trauma caused by high post and expiratory pressures. Infections, vascular fistulae, and stenosis as a late complication. And the tube, specifically, if they're too high, will cause vocal cord injury with a tension cuff. If they're too low, they will cause carinal injury by tip. Pool secretions above the retention cuff end up in the posterior basal segments of the lower lobes, and I showed you umpteen examples of those. And then air obstruction, if someone plays the tracheal tube rather aggressively and dislodges a tooth. Another mind is esophageal intubation. It causes huge gastric distension. So if you see an intensive care patient with markedly distended Get filled stomach, alert them for a possible esophageal intubation. The tube has been there for more than three weeks, it's likely to cause ulcerations and perforation. And look at the size of the balloon because it lead to tracheomalacia down the road. This is a pediatric patient. The corona is somewhere in this location here, and the endotracheal tube is clearly heading towards the right main stem bronchus, it will eventually lead to collapse of the left lung. The complications for the tracheostomy tube would be subcutaneous emphysema of the neck, pneumobedius, pneumothorax, and then tracheal perforation, especially the posterior wall. What graphic appearance or CT appearance of barotrauma is interstitial emphysema, pneumobedius, and pneumothorax. This patient who had ARDS and was on very high PEEP, you can see the patient has bilateral alveolar opacities. What you see is tram tracking caused by lucies. In other words, the tram tracking is caused by air along the blood vessels. And the CT demonstration of the tram tracking of air caused by interstitial emphysema. This one also has pneumomediastinum and a pneumothorax. patient who has a frontal tomogram showing tracheal stenosis caused by prolonged endotracheal tube placement. These radiographs obtained two years apart and someone who was on high oxygen for prolonged periods of time developed these coarse reticulonodular and somewhat cystic appearing lucencies in both lungs. This bronchomonary dysplasia what it looks like on CT. Ground opacities with very sized cystic lucencies in both lungs. Cardiovascular support devices. I will discuss central venous catheter, pulmonary artery catheter, also called Swan-Gans catheter, intraortic balloon pump, and I will not discuss pacemakers and defibrillators. The position of the CVC, it should be in the superior vena cava. It can be either through the subclavian or the internal jugular veins. If it is in the AJ and it can extend up to the cava atrial junction, it's acceptable. And the reason behind that is the last set of venous valves are really behind the medials and medial ends of both clavicles where the innominate veins begin. So anywhere near that point or central to that point, to the atrial junction is acceptable. Of central venous lines is pneumothorax only with subclavian. So if you encounter subclavian venous line placement, always look very closely for pneumothoraces. Admias, if are extending into the atrium, mediumal infusions, bleeding, bridge of catheter, and ization distally into the lung. While the central venous catheter is in adequate position, but the direction in which it is pointing 
against the lateral wall of the SVC is rather dangerous and dangerous, likely to cause massive hemorrhage and exsanguination. So this is a central venous catheter that should be withdrawn. Uh, given that we now have um, uh, monitors instead of hard copies, is to magnify all subclavian line attempts, look for subtle pleurons for pneumothoraces in the apex. So catheters are ideally placed from the right ventricular outflow tract to either the left or the right pulmonary main arteries. And they are acceptable up to the lobar arteries, and the way to them is that they're three centimeters lateral to the spine on either side. A pump is ideal distal to the, in, in the distal aortic arch, just past to the left subclavian artery. It's a pulmonary artery catheter in the right pulmonary artery. That's a good position. And this is the tip of the aortic balloon pump in the distal arch. And you can see the lucency of the balloon, so we know that this radiograph is obtained during diastole because that's when the balloon is inflated. Pulmonary catheter, aortic balloon pump tip. This is a little bit too low. It should have been a little bit higher to be ideal. The vascular devices, if it's a subclavian approach, is pneumothorax, ectopic infusion, hemorrhage, thrombosis, and embolism, leakage and embolization of catheter, pulmonary infarction, air embolism, and if the patient acquires infection, then septic embolism. The patient who had a right-sided subclavian catheter placement and they were not able to infuse much, and we got a radiograph after they removed it, and we found that most of the collection was anteriorly in the retroclavicular space. So this was a misplaced subclavian catheter with an extra pleural hematoma. Conditions of PA catheter are pulmonary infarction, arrhythmias, pulmonary pseudoaneurysm, and knotting of the catheter. This is a PA catheter that is too deep. It should be no more than three centimeters past the spine. So up to there would be acceptable, but anything beyond that's too deep and likely to cause problems. Somebody who was, was a CCU had a PA catheter for a long period of time and developed suddenly overnight this rounded opacity, the sudden appearance of a nodular opacity in the central lung zone, highly suspicious for a pseudoaneurysm. And it's proven by angiography. Another example of a real opacity that appeared was proven to be a pseudoaneurysm that was subsequently embolized. The of aortic balloon pump to keep in mind is it should not be flat to the subclavian artery. It dissections will cause chest pain and blurring of the descending aorta. Hemolysis of the balloon producing gas embolism distally, and then renal failure if it is too distal in placement. Only to the gastrointestinal support devices is the nasogastric tube and the feeding tube. I've discussed the rectal tube. For the nasogastric tube is the stomach, either in the fundus or the body of the stomach, and always mention the of the side hole, it must be past the G junction. Feed tube must be in the gastric antrum. This good position for a nasogastric tube. The side hole is well past the GE junction, and the tip is probably somewhere in the body of the stomach. Contents of nasogastric tubes and feeding tubes is malpositioned tubes, sinusitis, acid reflux and esophageal ulceration. This is a feeding tube extending into the lower lobe airway. The tube is in the fundus. It should be past the midline 
on side of the patient in the gastric antrum because that's where you want the feeding to take place because otherwise it will pull in the fundus and cause reflux and other problems attended with that. Tubesments are used for draining pleural fluid or evacuation of pleural air. Example of someone who had lung resection has two tubes, one is posterior to drain fluid and one is anterior to drain or evacuate pneumothorax. Cause complications. If the hole is outside the parietal pleura, they lead to extensive subcutaneous emphysema. Injury will lead to pneumothorax, and if it's kept in long enough, bronchopil fistula, hemorrhage, and if the patient develops fever, all remain mindful of the possibility of an empyema. The patient who had left chest tube developed a lenticular shaped pearl subcostal opacity that was an empyema. Common clinical questions and intensivists may come up with why did the patient develop respiratory distress? What a fluid status? What a cardiac status? Has there been any improvement or deterioration? Are there any nosocomial complications? And why does the patient have a fever? Some problems we deal with are atelectasis, aspiration. I showed you plenty of opacities, which may be due to aspiration or pneumonia. ARDS and fluid overload, heart failure, normal infections, and then for a delayed completion of bronchopulmonary dysplasia. So, poor chest x rays are treacherous as it is, become even more treacherous when we put kinds of gas in them, and that's what makes it very difficult. I'll be here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you.